remember that every day, as soon as I get out of bed, I, I see the photos of my, my sister, of my father, of my mother. And uh, uh, I never forget, not for one day, not for one hour. I can't forget that. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to speak to us. Um, before we speak to, to, to Rene, uh, uh, Paul, tell us about this exhibition. Where do these photographs come from? Tell us what the story you're trying to tell here. So when we say the name Auschwitz, I think the image that most people have come to mind is of trains arriving, people being unloaded onto the ramp, divided quickly and selected either for the camp or for the gas tank. These sorts of images kind of dominate our collective memory of that past, uh, not only of Auschwitz, but to some extent of the Holocaust itself. The thing that many people don't realize, though, is that all of those photographs and the only images, photographic images we have of arrival and selection at a death camp are from a single photograph album, commonly known as the Auschwitz album or the Lily Jacob album after the survivor who discovered it. And what we're trying to do in this exhibition is to look beyond those images because those photographs were all taken by SS guards. When we look at those images, we are seeing through the camera, through the viewfinder of the killers themselves. And we want in this exhibition to challenge that gaze and to have the visitor think more critically about the ways in which we've been thinking about this very difficult, complex and challenging history. Well, let's get to the ethics of that shortly. But, but, but Rene, you spend a lot of time talking about this, this now. What memories do you have of, of Auschwitz? What, 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 when, you, when you think about that, what, what do you recall? I recall everything from it right from the beginning to the end till I left Auschwitz. I arrived at Auschwitz from the Lodge Ghetto on an overnight train, which, uh, which was terrible. Without food, without water, no uh, sanitation. We arrived in the early hours of the morning. We didn't know where we where we going, by the way. We arrived in the early hours of the morning and screaming and bellowing immediately, get off the train, get a move on, be quick. That's first thing. They unbolted the doors, opened them up, and the screaming and bellowing, get off the train, get a move on, be quick. All around us was illuminated electrified fencing, and above them stood a rank of high watchtowers. There was an army of assessment and Gestapo, all heavily armed and with large guard dogs. You can't explain how frightened the people were. Guards moved in and uh, shoving us into columns. And some of them whispered, you are here now in Auschwitz-Birkenau. This is the place where people are being taken straight into the guest chamber. That was our greeting. And wherever they saw a woman holding a young child, a young baby or a child, a young child, they would say, hey, give the baby over to an old person so perhaps you can save your own life. And how, how old were you then at this point? I was 14 years old. And so people were saying when you arrived, because Auschwitz, was, were you, did you know that this was a death camp then? Did you know we, what Auschwitz was then? I didn't know anything about anything of the place. It was just, you know, they told us you're in Auschwitz and we didn't even know what Auschwitz is, whether it was a town or a village or whatever it was. It was a big camp, uh, illuminated, <laughs> illuminated, electrified, and... Uh, Above them stood a rank of high, high watchtowers and the guards, the SS, with their, with their large guard dogs. It was terribly, terribly frightening. They took us, the people who were taken to the guest chambers were taken away, went, went to the right. I was on the left with my mother. They took us to the end of the camp, into a large room, and there, everybody had their heads shaved. And um, they told us to leave the, our clothes on the, on the benches. Guards were walking about, collecting any valuables that anybody had, watches or rings or whatever. They collected that. And we left the, the, our clothes on the benches. They pushed us, pushed us in into a large room, which looked like a shower room. We thought that 
guest was coming through, but we were the lucky ones. They still needed us for the very hard work. So Walter came through. And afterwards, they let us in. They, they pushed us into a different hole where they gave us some clothes to put on. Now, to give you an example, they gave me a very large skirt which wouldn't stand up and a men's pyjama jacket. And what, what did you say to your mum? What did your mum say to you for these for the time you were there? How did you how did you my, process? How did you try and understand this? What did your mum say to you? My mum mum tried to 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 you know to encourage me to keep going, to keep going. I shouldn't lose any any faith. I, I should I should be strong. She wanted me to be strong to to you know. So she she looked after me and I looked after my mother the best we could. We couldn't do very much for one another, but we did, that did our best. That's what kept me going. I don't believe that if I wouldn't have my mother with me right through the war, I wouldn't have been alive. And she kept, and she kept you going, and you kept her going. But very sadly, just at the end, she, she died in hospital, didn't she? <coughs> she died. Yes, yeah, she died in the hospital twelve days after the liberation. On the 27th, 27th of April, 1945, she died. And do you still feel? Do you still feel anger? Do you still feel the pain every day? I mean, this is a long time ago now. These horrendous happenings to you and your family. How do you feel about it today? I, I remember that every day, as soon as I get out of bed, I, I see the photos of my my sister, of my father, of my mother. And uh, uh, I never forget, not for one day, not for one hour. I can't forget that. And Paul, this is this is what the exhibition is about, isn't it? In a sense, yes. It's easy to it's easy to say. Many people would say, "Well, Auschwitz will never be forgotten. It's mm -hmm. now become seared into our cultural memory." But that's not entirely true, is it, Paul? I suppose there's a fear that people will will make mischief by telling lies about it or they'll just it'll just pass into the distant past and then it'll it'll, it'll burn less strongly in the cultural imagination i think that's true and um and the issue is not only if we remember but how we remember and what we remember and i think uh listening to renee and it's such a privilege and an honor to have you here and talking to us renee yeah. this um this voice of those who were there, the voice of the survivors, the voices of the victims, are the stories that we wish to tell in this exhibition. So although the images, that most of the images that we're left with are created by the killers, by the perpetrators, in those photographs, of course, we can see the faces of the victims. And we want to do everything we can to rehumanize those um, people and tell their stories. Also the stories of their resilience and their resistance. So we include in the exhibition drawings by uh, the inmates, photographs taken with a smuggled camera from inside the crematorium. Yeah. Can you look at these pictures at all, Rene? How do you respond to things like that when you see images of, of Auschwitz? Does it, is it something you can look at or is it something that's too traumatic? If I look at it, it breaks my heart, but I have to look at it. I look at it because just, just it's heartbreaking to see it. I if everything comes back to life. You see it all as it happened. But but what, why do you think it's important still to look at it? Is it because that you don't want people to, to because forget? we don't want to forget, no. We mustn't forget. We mustn't let anybody forget. We also have, don't we, today um, continuing mass atrocities around the world other genocides that have unfolded since 1945. And I hope one of the things we can take from exhibitions like this and the stories and the inspiration from people like Rene is the strength to do more to try to prevent these sorts of atrocities. And um, the final part of this exhibition has a section called Before Our Eyes, which looks at film footage, news coverage of Rwanda, of Cambodia, uh, of the Yazidis, of Myanmar, uh, of continuing anti-Semitism in the world today as well. And I think it presents a, a challenging ethical problem for us, for all of us. Well, Paul, it's exactly right. And Rene, just to say that for everyone listening to this, um, we do appreciate you 
reliving these moments because uh, it's very brave of you to do that. It's so horrendous to even for us to even possibly imagine, but we, we do so, we're so grateful for you for taking the time and the trouble to talk to us.